Harrow on the Hill, Middlesex. It was in this very place that an event took place which has become, in hindsight, one of the major milestones of motoring. Apparently, what happened was this. A Mr Sewell was demonstrating a motor car to a potential customer, a Major James Richer. Evidently, the car ran out of control down there, Grove Hill Harrow, and turned over with fatal results for both those gentlemen. Thus, they have the very sad distinction of being the first two motorists to die in the United Kingdom as the result of a road accident. And when did all this happen? Way back in 1899, a very long time ago, at the very beginning of the age of the motor car. Of course, neither of those two unfortunates had taken a driving test. There wasn't one in 1899. Today, though, driving is very much a part of our lives. You could claim we've reached the end of the beginning. It took a further 36 years from that sad day in Harrow for us to realise that to unleash the untrained and untested driver onto the public roads was simply not acceptable anymore. Although in 1931 the first highway code was published, giving, as it does today, sound and useful advice on road behaviour, it wasn't until June 1, 1935, that the driving test was instituted as a compulsory requirement for those who wished to drive on the roads unaccompanied. Even so, looking at scenes like these, it probably wasn't that difficult to master the road conditions sufficiently to cope with the demands of the test. They were, relatively speaking, spacious days. Even the vehicles of that time, like this old Lagonda, must have led to a splendid sense of security. For a start, they were built like tanks. This was the heyday of cars with solid chassis and coach-built bodies, remember. And if they did take rather a long time to stop with their primitive braking, which meant you had to use the gearbox to help to slow you down, well, they took rather a long time to get going, too. Acceleration times were ponderous, top speeds were low. It's not that drivers were necessarily any better than they are today. It's just that in those days, there was more opportunity to be worse and get away with it. It's difficult for us to conceive, more than 50 years after, what motoring must have been like in the 30s. For a start, the 30 mile an hour speed limit had only just been introduced. The introduction of the 30 mile an hour speed limit, commented Autocar, has led to a number of inventive minds evolving various means of giving warning when this speed has been reached. Clearly, instrumentation was not very advanced. Trafficators, even the semaphore type, were virtually unknown. So it's not surprising that the early driving test placed heavy emphasis on hand signals. Today, though, it's as if we're driving in a different world. Traffic is much denser and tends to move much faster, though you might wonder sometimes. Today's car is a masterpiece of the development of high technology. It reacts very quickly, whether accelerating or stopping. It is, if you like, the metal equivalent of a highly trained show jumper. But you wouldn't expect to jump on the back of a horse for the first time and win the horse of the year show, would you? So, owning and driving one of today's modern cars, while it gives you freedom of movement, also imposes upon you a major responsibility. That responsibility is to make sure that you are master of the technology which the manufacturer has put at your disposal and capable of using that technology safely. So, to avoid the situation where the most dangerous nut on any vehicle is the one behind the wheel, it's absolutely vital that driving, like any other human skill, is taught properly and learnt thoroughly. Thus, over the years, the driving instructor, properly qualified and registered with the Department of Transport, has become an indispensable part of the art of learning these essential skills. While you can learn to drive at the hands of a well-intentioned friend or relative, and take the chance of picking up bad habits, of course, nothing will really come close to the benefit of proper professional instruction, with someone whose business it is to give just that, coupled with plenty of practice, of course. But however many lessons you have with the finest instructor, the day will arrive when you come to take the test. And, you know, it's a funny thing, but something very interesting seems to happen to people once those magic words, the driving test, are mentioned. Instantly, it seems, 
a whole saga of horror stories comes to light. Someone knows someone else whose second cousin is absolutely convinced that they failed through wearing the wrong shoes. Another friend will tell you that he actually knows the examiner who really has cloven hooves and a forked tail. Now the fact is that these stories are simply not true. But it's also a fact that some people believe the earth is flat, regardless of the evidence. Good afternoon. Mr Webb. Yes. Would you sign against your name, please? What you can say is that the man who examines your proficiency is going to be polite, certainly, but not exactly conversational once the driving part of the test has started. And if you think about the job the examiner does, you can see why. Nothing would be more confusing to a candidate in any kind of test or examination than to have his mind taken off the subject by needless chat. Will you read the number of the car directly ahead of you, please? AHO212R. Thank you. Will you get into your car now, please? Remember, the examiner is not testing your ability to control a car and have an interesting conversation at the same time. He's there to ensure that you demonstrate that your driving is safe enough to allow you to control on your own what has the awesome potential of a lethal weapon. So, after the initial procedures, the driving part of the test begins. Follow the road ahead, unless the traffic signs direct you otherwise, or unless I ask you to turn, which I'll do in good time. Move off when you're ready, please. Here again, we run into a number of misconceptions people have about the test. The first and greatest is that when you pass the test, you instantly become a fully experienced driver. That's simply not true, and we'll see why later. Take the next road on the right, please. But the other great misconceptions are that passing the test is only about mastering a series of apparently pointless manoeuvres, and that the whole test has no relevance to real driving. These, again, are far from the truth. But as people do remember the manoeuvres, let's start with them. Take this one, for instance. Everyone calls it the three-point turn, though it doesn't necessarily have to be completed in three movements, hence its official title, the turn in the road. At first sight, this simply appears nothing less than a fiendish attempt by the examiner to get you to fail. But wait. You couldn't have a more commonplace everyday situation than this, just parking while you pop to the shots. Try doing this if you haven't learnt the skills of the turn in the road manoeuvre. Here's another one, the emergency stop. Stop. Can you really be certain that in all the years you'll be driving something like this will never happen? Certainly this driver is going to have to master the slope on his garage drive every day of his life. It's that kind of everyday situation which shows the relevance of the hill start in the test. The object of the exercise is to demonstrate that you can control the smooth takeoff of a vehicle from rest on a slope. Here's an angled start. Looks too simple to be worth examining, doesn't it? Will you feel the same in a situation like this? Somehow, I rather doubt it. It's here that all that tuition and practice will pay off. So, those few examples clearly show that the manoeuvres are relevant to everyday driving. But don't forget, most of the test isn't about manoeuvres. It's about what you might call the essentially ordinary bit, the general driving if you like. Because it's here that you're showing to the examiner, and he's assessing, your ability to cope with the very real demands of ordinary everyday traffic, which is, let's face it, what driving is actually about for most of the time.
Later on in his life, when he's more experienced, this candidate will appreciate the time he took learning this basic skill. Of course, if you're a sales executive, an engineer, or whoever, getting to the meeting is secondary to what happens when you arrive. But you do still have to get there, and that demands the ability to cope with all kinds of traffic conditions. There's no point in having the big sales deal at the other end of the trip if you never actually arrive at the other end because a loss of concentration has led you into an accident on the way. Now I'd like to put a few questions on the highway code and other motoring matters. So, your test is nearing its end with the highway code and other motoring questions. These are just as much a part of the test as anything we've seen. But then you really should have mastered them anyway, and particularly the code, put them into practice before you took the test in the first place. I'd like you to identify these traffic signs as I show them to you, please. So the examiner is not looking for parrot fashion answers. He's looking for you to show him now, just as you did during the driving part of the test, that you have a true understanding of what safe driving is all about. Get all that right and... That's the end of the test, Mr. Webb, and I'm pleased to tell you you've passed. Thank you. You now have a legal right to drive unaccompanied. But, as Churchill said, you've now reached the end of the beginning. That means you now have a duty to gain further experience and become a safer driver. If you're sensible, you'll take up the challenge seriously by training for and taking an advanced test so that your driving is not only safer, but more enjoyable. But let's not underestimate your achievement. We've shown that the driving test is both relevant and vital to road safety. Candidates who pass should take pride that they've demonstrated the basic skills of driving. But pride can often come before a fall, so it's worth remembering that passing the test, while it is an achievement, imposes a great responsibility. The responsibility of being a safe and proficient user of the roads. And the reward for this proficiency? The valuable right to freedom of movement 